Hey y'all, happy baby Friday. Uh, I am very excited to have um, this Victoria Mall as my guest today on Healthcare Happenings. Um, and I wanted to start out, I did a little, cause today is Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, so Groundhog Day actually started out over in Europe um, with the Celts and the Germans. Um, the Celts had, it, it was a pagan holiday at first, of course. And then when Christianity like went across Europe, then they took it over and turned it into something that was called Candlemas. And it was supposed to commemorate when Jesus was introduced to the temple in Jerusalem. And if it was sunny, it was supposed to mean there were 40 more days of cold and snow. Well, when the Germans came over here, they settled in Pennsylvania first, and they brought that tradition with them. And in, to kind of adapt to it with their tradition, it was badgers and little animals if they saw their, you know, if, it, if they saw their shadow. And then because of going in Pennsylvania, they decided to choose the groundhog because it was, you know, uh, native to that area. So that is how groundhogs out. And the first one here in the United States was in 1887. So that's the little history of Groundhog Day, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and and I think if I'm wrong, Betty, but I heard that he he saw. I he think he saw his shadow. shadow. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think he did. More, I don't. I don't know. I'm not feeling six more weeks of winter. I think it's been pretty mild up near me, and I think that we're gonna have a mild winter, and then like. April will have like a random snowstorm. <laughs> I think it's going to be one of those years. Everything will shut down. <laughs> yes, I, I think I, I, at lunch I'm, now I, I really don't because I'm in Florida. So I, I, I'm in Florida, so I don't have to pay attention to it. I you don't have to worry about this. Never these or not. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you mean it's only going to be 79 degrees? <laughs> so, you know, and then, you know, people are just like, I hate you. So, you know, I kind of stay out of the Groundhog Day thing. Um, so uh, we are getting a lot of people coming in. Oh, lady. Hey, lady. She is one of our loyal people from out in California. She is in the uh, Orange Irvine local chapter. And I am going to be doing an e &M workshop for their local chapter in February. So um, good to see that she's on here. So um, and Barbara Shaw. So we got a lot of people coming in. Everybody saying hey. Um, and. For those of y'all that don't know, and I know there's probably not many, uh, but Victoria Mole, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, she has over 15 years experience in professional medical coding. And if you've ever seen any one of her YouTube videos, you know that she is passionate about providing engaging and uh, cost-effective education. She's always trying to give tips and different things out. And um, she has multi-specialty experience and uh, she is on or has served on the AAPC Chapter Association Board of Directors. So that's the AAPC -A -A -C -C -A B O D. <laughs> from 2020 to 2022. Uh, so um, if you haven't, you know, make sure you check her out over there on YouTube with her videos. I've got some links and stuff to, to put up for y'all later with her. And um, uh, Catherine, just on our groundhog theme for me, remember he's just a giant squirrel. So <laughs> the groundhog. All right. Um, and everybody's saying they love you, Victoria, and you're, you're amazing. So that's very nice. So um, to, to just talk with you a little bit more so people can get a little more info on you, because I know mm -hmm. you give some information when you talk on your YouTube thing, but, you know, you're not like interviewing yourself, really. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes I know when I talk about a subject, I end up in a story that kind of gives a piece, you know, but um, uh, where, uh, where did you or what got you into the field in the first place? Um, so, you know, it's funny. Um, when I started in medical coding, almost everyone's story was kind of the same. They're like, oh, you know, I was working in a, a private physician office and I did, you know, front desk work. And then one day I learned what medical billing and coding was and they pulled me in. Uh, that's certainly not most people's stories, I think, these days. And it was certainly not my story at the time. I, uh, 
I was, oh gosh, I, you know, in high school, I was not the most devoted of students. I was very smart. I just did like, I didn't get things. I just didn't understand the importance of like getting good grades and getting into college. Like my, I came from a very middle class family and they didn't push me to like go into college or, or you know, uh, get a bachelor's degree, anything like that. And I really just like, I was a mess and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to watch anime. That's what I was into. I'm <laughs> <laughs> to watch, you know, movies and, and TV shows. And I, you know, I just didn't get the whole getting into college thing. And uh, I really didn't know career wise, like what I wanted to do. I guess I just always kind of assumed I'd wind up working in an office or something like being someone's secretary. And, uh, you know, my mother one day, she worked as a CNA and she was amazing. She was a great CNA. She'd been doing, she was a candy striper, as they called them. You know. Uh huh. <laughs> She had a little hat and a little the little striped jumper. Yeah. So she'd been doing it since back when she was 16 and she was a candy striper. And uh, the one day she came to me and she goes, you know, Victoria, you know, I know you kind of don't know what you want to do. She's like, there's this lady that works at the nursing home. She has her own office and she has these code books and she just they get give her these charts and she looks up these codes for them um she might talk to the doctors a little bit but other than that like no one really bothers her she leaves on time every day it seems like a pretty good job you know have you ever thought about getting into this medical coding thing and i'm like mom like any teenager mom that sounds like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like you don't know what you're talking about. This is just you know blah 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 blew her off. I really liked web design though at the time. So I did go to college for web design. Um, I was maybe just a couple credits short of graduating for web design. I got really bad depression, like really bad depression. Um. Dropped out of college uh, to kind of get things straightened out. And then, you know, I also realized I really liked web design as a hobby more than I did as a profession. So then here I am again, you know, now I'm in my mid twenties almost and still don't know what the heck I'm going to do. And I'm like, ah, you know, I kind of, I took like administrative jobs working at like offices and doing filing clerks and data entry. And I'm like, you know, I just, I really want something specialized. And I'm like, didn't my mom say to me a while ago, something about this, <laughs> <laughs> this yes, medical code? Always when we're adults that those things start to come back, right? Oh, oh, she was right. <laughs> So I went back to my community college, you know, back, this was, oh gosh, 2007-ish, I guess. Uh, back then, they didn't really have associate's degrees for medical billing and coding. Um, those only have come out in the past, maybe, you know, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So the closest they had was like medical secretary, which did involve like some coding stuff. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back. And I talked to admissions office and I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to, you know, get a job in medical billing and coding. I was thinking about getting my associates as a medical secretary. And they're like, no, you don't want to be in this building. They're like, we have a career training building just across the hall that will get you a job. They'll train you in like six months. You could probably qualify for grants over there. Just walk across the street and go over and talk to them. <laughs> they <laughs> so hooked you up. I, I walked across the street. I got enrolled in their medical billing and coding program. I got a full workforce improvement grant that paid for everything. Um, and I just, you know, I grasped every opportunity that came my way. You know, when they were like, hey, we have, you know, we're, we're changing EMR systems or, or revenue cycle systems. We need someone to go in and load the old schedules into the new system. OK, cool. I'll go and do that. You know, um, we need someone to work on this new charge scrubber program and make sure that it's working. OK, cool. I'll, I'll go do that. Um, we need someone. To, we need we need certified coders. So we're going to bring in an instructor and they're going to train you to, to get your CPC certification. I'm like, all right, sign me up. They're like, if you pass, we'll, we'll, we'll cover the cost of it. Awesome. So that's how I got certified. Like my first job that I went in for to do charge entry uh, after school, I, I was hired off my internship. They trained me as a CPC. They put me on all kinds of projects and I did whatever I could until I kind of ran out of whatever I could do there and then hopped over to, you know, the next opportunity. Ah, that's, that's, that's good. And I think that's an important thing um, for people to remember when we're talking about, you know, we get a lot of those things from CPCAs and people now that's like, I can't find, you know, I can't get a job. I can't get in. I can't get in as a coder. It doesn't always have to start as a coder, you know, expand your mind a little bit, you know, just get in. And then from there, you know, there's a lot, once I found once you get into a place, 
they would much rather use the people they have yeah. than, you know, try to hunt for somebody and train somebody. And, you know, it's always easier to do it from within. So, you know, just getting your foot in the door is the, the good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a lot easier to just shift over someone who's already on payroll and already has benefits. Yeah. Uh, and they know that you're a hard worker. They know that you're a team player. Like if you're someone who like, I always say like just the, the assignments that no one else wants to take, those were the ones I volunteered for. And that was what kind of sh showed off over the years. They were like, oh, Victoria is willing to work on these projects. She's willing mm -hmm. to do more. Um, and it didn't necessarily mean like I was working 10 hours of overtime. It's just right. that I was doing some something beyond what was my job description. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm, I, that's the thing that um, directors and may, they always remember that stuff. You know, then you start to be the first person in their mind when something new comes up and they start thinking. So it's, it's you know, doing all of those kind of little things that can end up making a big difference, you know, in a career. Uh, and speaking of your career, so from there, when did you start Contempo Coding? Or oh, did God. the YouTube videos come first, <laughs> which came like chicken or the egg thing? Yeah, I guess a Contempo Coding came first. So I've always been... Um, very, you know, looking for the next thing, like, what's the next thing I can do? What's the next thing I can do? So, you know, from charge entry, I went into AR, I was a in AR for maybe seven months, I didn't stay there terribly long, um, went and worked in um, code, I got that I got a coding job, I coded for hospitalists, and then general surgery. And then I was coding for uh, a lot of plastic and reconstructive surgery. I've done tons and tons of plastic and reconstructive surgery coding over my years. Got certified in plastic and reconstructive surgery coding, you know, when they still had a certification for that, got my auditing certification, you know, all that extra stuff. And, uh, you know, I always had this thought in my mind that, you know, I would like to do what my instructor did. I wanted to teach, you know, CPC preparation classes. So I started writing articles and I started doing some presentations and, you know, I'd present at the, the local chapters and then I presented at HealthCon. Um, and it was always this goal that, you know, eventually I want to become an AAPC instructor. Uh, you know, when, when, you know, the, the, the curriculum has evolved over the years, obviously. Mm -hmm. And when I started, you know, 15 some years ago, it, 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 it wasn't much. It was literally like slides. Like that was it. They gave you the slides and and my instructor basically handed us the CPT book and we just, and this is this section and this is this section and this is this section and this is this section. And I always wanted to aspire to being able to present the material a little bit better than, you know, what was provided back when I was educated. Um, so I started doing little dippy things here and there, like, oh, I'm going to do the CPC preparation class. And I thought, oh, well, this shouldn't just be Victoria Mole. I'll, you know, build up a little business for myself. I don't think it officially became a business until a few years ago when I registered it as such. Um, but I had, you know, dippied into making some videos on my own uh, years and years ago. I think they might still be up on YouTube on a different <laughs> channel somewhere. I Every now and then I come across them. But, uh, you know, I just really love doing education. I really liked making it visual. And that just seemed like a natural thing to me to like put things on video and not just do the PowerPoint slide presentation where I'm reading off of the slides, try and make something that was a little more interactive, a little bit more engaging. And, um, you know, I, you know, I went through some life events that just made that not possible <laughs> for a while. Uh, I got divorced. I, you know, hand to hand in the keys to the mobile home that we owned, owned together. I had to move in back with my dad because I couldn't afford to pay for a mobile home and pay for child care at the same time as a single mom. Yeah. Um, and because that, the house that I was living in was like loud and there wasn't a lot of space, like I, I didn't have recording area. Eventually it was really nice. Um, one of the girls that worked at the hospital that I worked at was like, hey, there's this little like secret library that no one uses and you could go and record videos there and like no one would know. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I like went and recorded little videos in the secret library and stuff to get little uh, presentations and stuff together. And then uh, it was actually Valentine's Day three years ago. I closed on my house right before the pandemic hit because I and I was so excited I had this nice little home office then to sit and the whole point of that was like I'm going to sit here I'm going to be able to do remote webinars I'm going to be able to work from home I'm going to be able to do these YouTube channels 
I was in that house for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, I think, before the <laughs> pandemic hit. And it was just such this good timing because, you know, once that pandemic hit and everyone was on lockdown, the first thing people started doing were like, oh, well, I need to work from home. I don't want to go out in this. You know, what are the top work from home jobs? And then they go into Google and then there's Victoria with this video, like, hey, you can work from home and be a medical <laughs> coder. Um, and the audience has really grown from there. You know, I try to cover a little bit of everything, you know, a lot of certification prep stuff, because that's what people are interested in, a lot of introductory stuff. But then I also will go, oh, let's go into a case study. Let's talk about ENM coding. Let's talk about how to get your CEUs, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, the channel has done like so phenomenally. It's it's shocking. Um, I It wasn't maybe more than a year that I, I left my full-time auditing position and decided I'm just gonna I'm just gonna run my own business and I'm gonna teach you know a couple of certification preps. Uh, I don't teach the CPC because I think it would just be too overwhelming. I think I would have to just set too many boundaries with people of like, <laughs> you know, do you know med term and do you do this and so it's it's easier yeah. to just turf those off onto someone else and kind of focus more on the specialties, more on CEUs and stuff than yeah. than the medical coding 101 because there's way too big of an audience requesting that that I would be able to handle. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so now the channel, I work full time. I mean, the channel is pretty much my primary focus right now. And then I take like 1099 jobs and I, you know, did little odds and ends things, you know, teaching the certifications and so forth. But uh, 95,000 subscribers I'm at right now. And I gain about a thousand subscribers every week. So I'm about five weeks away from hitting 100,000 subscribers, which is like a huge milestone yes. in YouTube. They actually give you a placard that says, you know, you have the silver play button, they call it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited for, for hitting that milestone soon. So we'll be watching for another LinkedIn announcement when you do, because I, I remember the, it was the cake you did, right? But last yeah, time? That was, yeah. it was just a year ago. I hit 50K and yeah, now I'm at a hundred, I'm going to be hitting a hundred thousand soon. That's amazing. Uh, and we have a couple, I just wanted to put these up for, um, Sonia, uh, for you, she loves the way you speak, making cheerful presentations and that you're inspiring. So I wanted to share that. Oh, and she's, she's been following you since September, 2021. She was a Penn Foster student. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. All that right. was one of the other things that was, I think, really good timing was, you know, then we had all of these people that signed up for medical coding or we're in the middle of classes that were in person. Wow. And then in the pandemic, all of a sudden now they're remote. And these teachers, they didn't, they, they've never had to deal with this before. A lot of them, they went in person and they're physically took to them, like flip to this page and then we're gonna look. Right. So a lot of people were so confused about how to use that technology. How do we still teach medical coding? How do we show them what to do in their book um, in a virtual environment? So. I, I, it was nice to be able to fill in some gaps for a lot of those students that were really struggling and say, oh, you know, maybe get uh, subjects click for them because not that they had bad instructors, but their instructors were just thrown into something new that they didn't know how to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and that's, you know, it, and that's one of the things when, you know, like leading into what we're talking about today in education, it, it's not always about the person that knows the most. Yes. You know, it's about how they come across and how they deliver and how they engage. You know, uh, I've been, you know, I, I attend the CPT symposium every year. Do you, do you go to that, Victoria? I do not. Okay. Well, it is, um, well, when it was in a place, it was in Chicago because that's where they're headquartered. Um, the last couple of years have been virtual. I'm hoping it'll be in person uh, this year, but um you get to go and sit for three days and listen to the physicians that are on the RUC committee that made the codes tell you why they made the codes. And I'm like, well, how great could that be? You know, you're getting it right from the horse's mouth, right? So it, it is just spot on information. And they mm -hmm. do really show some neat stuff. Some of the doctors have real good pictures. And some of the physicians are extremely engaging and really funny. You know, they'll put little pictures of the, the one guy that does the E&M. He's always got pictures of his dogs coming up and doing different. <laughs> he's making jokes. And one guy's got Yoda from, you know, coming on there when he's making jokes about something. And I'm like, okay, well, one year 
And, and it's every year. There's always got to be one. There, there's just, you know, the person that is the monotone reading the slides. And one year, I think it was an anesthesiologist, which was, I'm thinking this is fitting because I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> fall asleep. And he just, in that level tone, going through word for word, every slot for an hour <laughs> uh, i was like oh i'm like please i'm gonna die um and it was uh, the information fabulous but yeah. you know it's just like please just give me the slides and go to the next, <laughs> go to the next person <laughs> i don't think i could take it you know so um that's that's something as as we're gonna talk about you know, education, you know, um, when you're talking with your providers, you know, it, it's very important that it's not like everything is technical and you're throwing like 80 codes at them at once because they're right. just going to be what, you know, um, th that's not their world and you're trying to bring them into it and pay more attention to it. So you want it to sound fun at, le <laughs> at least, right? <laughs> so, oh, Pam's on, Pam Vanderbilt. Hey, Pam. So um, in the talking about physician education, that, that's, that's um, you know, I, I'm sure you've had many varying different types of physicians, uh, you know, all of us, you know, we get some that are very good, some that are not so good, you know, um, and, and um, it's that, uh, first of all, I think the important thing is you got to love it, right? Yes. You know, and that's one of the interesting things is when I started getting into physician education, I, uh, my, my management was not supportive at the time. Like I, I was clearly like, I, I love doing education. I want to get into education. And I was told, no, you don't, you don't want to work with physicians. They're all terrible. Yeah. You don't, you do not want to go and work with the physicians. And I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> And I realized over time that it was because they didn't enjoy it. So they were reflecting their own thoughts about how they don't like doing physician education and assuming that then I also did not, would not enjoy it and would not be successful doing it. Yeah. Or, or you have that one experience with that one, you know, because everybody has bad days and, you know, there's good and bad everywhere. And you, I'd have somebody that would get it and it didn't go well and they would come back and they was like, that's it. You know, um, but but I remember I had uh, one when I was a director at, at this um, one facility. Each co the auditors were assigned, you know, to their specialty areas, and we started putting out there. I said, you know, they should be meeting with these physicians. I mean, over the phone is fine, but you need that personal that you, you need to get in front of them. You need to sit with them. You need to, you know, make sure they're engaging with you. And uh, I had one auditor that, man, she was crackerjack, the best thing since sliced bread. But every time it came her appointment time to go see her doctors, she was sick or, you know, she had a car. It was like, and I was just like, man, nah, something's not right with it. Yeah. <laughs> it just, you know, I'm like, what did, and she, it was just, she was scared and was just like, I, I, I just, I can't talk to them. I don't, I was, well, you talk to them on the phone, you know, so um, you have to love what you're doing and you have to be able to, you know, um, get that point across to physicians and not be scared of them. They're, they're, yeah. they're just people. I mean, you know, um, uh, but yeah, it can be intimidating for people. I found that. So it's not everybody's bag, just like auditing isn't just like, you know, you have to kind of find your lane. Um, but if that's what you like to do, it's like fabulous when you get in a room of physicians, right? And yeah. you get them all where they're like, oh my gosh. And, you know, then it's just like they could carry you around on their shoulders. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. But it, it's understandable though that it's not everyone's cup of tea because some people aren't able to compartmentalize. Some people aren't allowed, uh, just don't have that capacity to separate you know, the provider is upset at this situation or this reg regulation. They're not upset at me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. some people really have, they're people pleasers and they can't distinguish between yeah. those two things. That's true. Um, it, it did take me a little bit, you know, the first, I'll, I'll admit the first couple of times, you know, when I had a rough one, it, it, I would go back to the office and cry, you know, it's just like, he was so mean. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
<laughs> but then yeah, then a after you hit a couple, you know, then it's like okay, you, you know, again, like you said, they're not mad at me. They're mad because they're frustrated. They don't understand this. It changes every year, you know. So I kind of changed the way I started starting out when mm -hmm. I'd speak to them too. When I'd have them in a big group, I'm like, hey, just the messenger here. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you know, I didn't make the book. I didn't make the rules. I'm trying to assist you, you know, and and say that I think these things are very frustrating. I understand, you know. So when you let them know that you get it, that you're not there just to kind of preach at them, I think and that helps. It is so important to, especially when you're working with groups, to set that tone. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in on provider education or was with someone who was doing education and they come in and it's, all right, I know, I know it's Friday morning and none of us want to be here. And, you know, we've got this exciting presentation on e and and I know you don't really want to listen to it, but, you know, we're just going to try and get through it as fast as we can. Okay. Okay. And then they just start and it's like, wow, now no one wants to listen to you. You need to yeah. start with like, you know, a little, I'm not saying you have to be the perfect presenter, but start with that little bit of a hook, a little bit of an introduction. If you can think of, I used to like to tell, and I don't get to do it as much anymore because my kid's a little girl, but I would always have like little funny stories about my kid or something that I could throw in about like how she thought I did something funny, you know, and my job wasn't, you know, she's, what did she say when she was, what, did, what was it she used to say when she was a kid? That my job was... I was trying to explain to her when she was little that like my job is to make sure that providers and, and doctors get paid for what they do. And she had some kind of like funny thing that she thought it was that I do. Oh, she's like, oh, my doc, my, my mom teaches the doctors or something like that. And I'm like, oh, well, she's like, I'm like, I, I do, but not about like doctors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just not how um, to be a doctor. <laughs> but it's, it's so important to set that tone and not have it be, you know, we're just going to try and get through it, even if it's just, you know, presenting yourself, presenting that you are the authority on this topic. And now we're going to get it like, e even that is is better than, hey, it's Friday morning and no one wants to be here. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I had some times where uh, I have been brought in to speak and the administrator that that um, uh, introduces me starts off like that. And I'm like, yeah. oh, please don't You're do like that. You know, it was like, you know, we're required to do this. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, then I, I do when I saw it, it's like, well, we're going to try to make this interesting, at least for y'all. I know you and you, you uh, just kind of go from there. But yeah, just be yourself when you're talking with them. You don't have to act like super professional. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be professional. It's not like you're going to go in there telling, you know, like, dirty jokes or anything but <laughs> you know I mean, but, i've been to a couple of presentations where every now and then they'll someone will slip one out and it'll be like "Ooh, okay well <laughs> there we go <laughs> but yeah it just um uh, they'll they can tell the physicians and the apps the people that you're training can tell if you are into it or not you can always <laughs> tell so i mean that that helps you know so um, and then as I was saying about not knowing everything, you know, admit it, you know, I, I'm always like, yeah, I, I don't know it all. Um, I've had people, but you know, sometimes you'll go into a place and sometimes the, um, coding and billing staff are not happy to see you as a consultant coming in, you know, they kind of take it like as an offense. Yeah. Um, and I would have them to where, you know, we'd be doing a training or talking about something. And one of them would start spouting codes, like throwing codes in my face. Well, what do you think about XXXSX? And yeah. blah, blah. I'm like, I yeah. don't know what that is off the I top know. of my head. I'm not a walking CPT book. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, I don't know. I don't memorize codes. You know, I said, you know, but we can look in the code book and I can, once I see what the guideline is, it will probably remind me of a different guideline or something that CMS has come up. You know, I said, but no, I, I, I'm not walking in or I don't have an eidetic memory where I can just, you know, throw everything back that I looked at. Uh, but it's saying that, first of all, you know, not trying to come off like, you know, everything, because I've seen yeah. a lot of people get in trouble giving advice that wasn't right. You know, right. because they you didn't want to be their... embarrassed by not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot better to just say, you know what? I think I know the answer to that, 
but I want to double check and make sure that I don't lead you in the wrong, wrong direction. So let me write that down and I'll get back to you. That's a lot better than just guessing on what you think it might be. Yep. Um, and then do it. That's the other thing. I, I've gone into some places before where they've said, well, you know, the auditing department here, you know, every time they meet with me, they give me my report. I ask questions. They tell me they put back to me and then never hear from them again. You know, uh, now that was mostly true. But when we went back to the auditing department at this place, they had, I think, three auditors for like, a couple hundred physicians and I'm like <laughs> I don't know how they get through any I don't know how they meet with anybody let alone yeah. answer questions you know so it was I'm like there there has to be a little work going on here but these people need help but you know when you say you're going to do something you know make sure you're following through on it too um let's see we got some I'm gonna pull some of our uh Sonia, yes, very true. It's just tone which can make differences, no matter even if it is Friday morning or Monday morning. So, um, yeah, they 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 pick up on that. You know, just like you know, I, I kind of look at it like, um, and I don't mean this like like physicians are dogs, but I mean if you think about like your um, your your pet, you know, they don't understand. English, everything you're speaking or saying to them. But if you say their name in that high pitched, sweetie voice, you know, they start wagging their tail. You could say their name, but in a mean voice, and their tail would stop wagging. You're saying the yeah. same thing, but it's the delivery, you know, that kind of changes it. I, I decided to put that up there for from your um, that you had a happy birthday. So, uh, yeah, I just turned 40. Fabulous 40. Ooh. Wait till you get to nifty 50. <laughs> I passed that one too, but you know. <laughs> so we have being an educator's reward. Yes, paying it forward. So, hey, Kimberly. Um, let's see. Let's see if we have any questions. Oh, people sometimes feel intimidated by external consultants because they think their quest to work as questions, but the reality is they're very helpful. Yeah, that that's, and it's the same thing with the physicians. Sometimes the physicians look at us like a hired gun coming in when I, you know, um, and sometimes, sometimes I am, and I'm sure that that's happened for you before too. Sometimes they're just mm -hmm. like, we don't want to be the bad guy. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, that's okay. You know, because I can be the bad guy and then I leave. So you know, then from yeah. then on, they get, we, we really would like to let you do it, but you know, that Betty. <laughs> you know? My favorite though, is always when, uh, when the doctors don't want to believe their internal auditors or their internal coders and they say, oh, well, we have to bring this external auditor or coder, whatever, a consultant in, in to talk to them because, you know, these people don't know what they're talking about. And doesn't the external consultants say the exact same thing and the providers act like this is the first time I'm hearing this. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's like Jesus came there, did the, Moses did the staff and there went the water, you know, um, yes, yes, I've had that. And then when they do this, you could see the coding and billing and manager, you can see the smoke just starting to, you know, they're just like, oh, you know, so I, I'm always like, oh, okay. And then, you know, you do that behind where you look at them and go, I, you're just like, I know, I know you've told them, you know? um, but yes, it, it's sometimes that helps just that difference in opinion. I, I think there was, um, I was listening to, you know, those um, people that do all the, like the phone gags and the phone pranks mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And they, they, had, somebody had, had, was listening to something and did the study off of one. And I thought it was very interesting. They had, a, they, they had people call. Uh, when they had people that were upset, you know, mm -hmm. when, when they had, it was like a complaint department kind of thing. So people would call in and they would be upset and yelling about whatever it was. And the first person would tell them what their rule was or whatever it was. And it was like, you know, well, uh, I want to talk to a manager, you know, and so they would say, okay, hold on for a minute. And they would put the person on hold, hand the phone to the next person who wasn't a manager, who was just somebody different. You know, and they would get on and just because they said it was the manager, mm -hmm. the person's tone changed and their attitude changed. They still had to complain, but they didn't come at it the same way. So I see that, too, sometimes where people in an office will tell me that 
like their physicians are awful or this one's bad or that. But then when I meet with them, I'm like, oh, they're a teddy bear or they're, you know, or they, they were really nice. I once went to meet with, I think they were pediatric cardiologists and they were having such a time at this organization with these pediatric cardiologists. Oh, they don't want to listen to these coders. Oh, they're so terrible. Oh, they're so mean. Victoria, can you go out and talk to them? Because, you know, maybe they'll listen to you and you do such good presentations on, on e and and I'm like, all right, cool. Drive, drove out to Hershey to meet with these providers. The, the whole presentation I did was I literally just brought up the score sheet on the overhead and was like, and this is this and this and this. And they're like, wait, 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 and this and that. And we can do that. So if I have a discussion with another provider and I count it over here and I'm like, yeah, they thought that was the greatest presentation they ever had. They're like, Victoria, I don't know what you did with these physicians. They think that you're amazing. They said that they are such a great edge. I'm like, literally all I did was I didn't I barely came prepared all I did was go over the score sheet like that's literally all I did (laughs) yeah it's it's amazing I had no it's funny because mine was a pediatric uh doctor too and and the same kind of thing and I was working with her with her notes and showing her in her documentation you know, and, and she was like, well, and I said, well, and this, I was like, you didn't count this and you did this counseling time, but it's not in here. And if you coded this by time, and if you would have said this, you could have coded it by time and it would have yep. been, th- and you know, then the, the, she's just like, oh, well, I do that all the time. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, well then you should be doing this all the time. And then you could get paid what you're supposed to be being paid for it. And it's the same thing. You know, once you, you show them those tracks, it's just mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, um, and, and sometimes it just takes it outside thing. Um, but you brought up a point with what you said about throwing that score sheet up and me with sitting with this doctor doing the um, doing the um, charts with her. Sometimes some people, you know, just like everybody else, some people are different types of learners and some people are those visual learners or kinesthetic learners where they learn by doing. So if you're, you know, doing it with them and they're seeing it and they're touching the notes and stuff like it's just, it's going to better. And so if you're trying to do those things over the phone with them all the time, yeah, yeah they're not going to be paying attention to you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause some providers want you to sit next to them while they go through it in the EMR and they're like, well, wait, let me show you like what I do. And I want you to see, okay, now let's try it out. And oh yeah, now I'm seeing what you're talking about. Or oh, hold on, I'm gonna put this macro in right now. And if I put this in, is this what I need in order to build the level of service that I think I should be billing? Yep. Okay. Now we're good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, it's fun. One of the services that I do, it well, it's kind of been on the down since the pandemic because nobody wanted to go anywhere. But I shadow physicians, you mm-hmm. know, and um, when I do it in their clinics, you know, I'll go in the room with them mm-hmm. and with the patient's permission. You know, it's not like they just like like, hey, this stranger is just going to stand over there while you undress. <laughs> you know, so it's like, <clears throat> I'll go and I stand in a corner. Uh, you know, I, I say hi if the patient says hi to me. If they don't, I don't, you know, I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. I go in whatever corner, you know, I can that seems the most unobtrusive. And I just listen to what the physician's saying, watch the kind of exam they're doing. And I have a little notebook and I just write little things down. I put what time we go in the room. I put what time we came out of the room, you know, and we get outside and then um, I'll ask the physician, okay, what do you think that was? And they'll say, oh, well, that was a four. And I'm like, okay, why? You know, and, or that was, a th- I was like, no, no, that should have been a four. That should have, you know, uh, I have one doctor, she was in with this patient. And unfortunately, it was a patient that um, was diagnosed with cancer. So it, it, when she went in there, the visit took a long time. And um, when I came, she was just, she was in there for an hour and she came out and she was just like, she went to like, go to do her documentation. And I was talking to her, I said, you know, that's definitely a coding by time visit, right? right. And she's like, oh, she, she looks and she goes, you know, she's like, I don't even know how long I was in there. It, so it, it just brings that because yeah. the, the visit went, she was just like, it, it was just so overwhelming that I, so I, I, I couldn't even track it. You know, I didn't track it. And I was like, well, you know, there's something to pay more attention to. And so I told her how long, because I said, I wrote it down so you can document that this is how long you spent counseling and coordinating care with this patient. So you get paid appropriately for that visit, you know, um, and they love that stuff. And then I write a report 
about all the patients I saw with them and all this stuff. And then I send it to them. And then if it's a big place, the, you know, administrators get it and stuff. And yeah, the, the, they just think that's the best thing ever. They fight when you go to the clinic, then we'd go to the clinic and it was just like, I get her first. No, I get, well, I have a patient next. Can you come and see my patient? I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. You know? Yeah. I used so, to, I used to round with, uh, in the, in the office. And then I used for a while I was rounding with, uh, hospitalists in the, in the hospital, kind of seeing what they were doing, what they were examining. Okay. Are you, is what you're writing down in your documentation, what I actually saw you examine? Uh, <laughs> and, um, Oh, now I've lost my train of thought. But yeah, it was interesting always to see how they like first off presented to patients who I was. I had one physician who said, uh, this is Victoria. She's just here to check my spelling because the patient I think was like demented and wouldn't know anyone. <laughs> so the, she told the patient I was just there to spell it. Oh, that's where I was going. So it, some of the providers, yeah, they were very, very engaged. And they're like, yeah, I want you to see what I do here. And I want you to see what I do here. And then there were, you know, a couple of outliers that I would have to like chase down in the physician lounge because yeah. their practice manager like gave yeah. me the password and the access that I could swipe right in. So I could hunt them down. I'd be like, hey, remember me? I'm supposed to be shadowing you today. What time are we getting started? Uh -huh. I, I did have a couple that were just like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, and I was like, well, you know, so they'd let me in on one and they were just like, that's enough. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, uh, let's see, we got uh, Pam has a little comment about six months after I left my last practice, I went in to visit. One of the docs stopped me in the hall and went off because after I left, they hired a consultant to do an RCM assessment. And the end result was a report full of recommendations that I had made while they paid me as an employee. <laughs> she was even more upset because they paid $35,000 to hear that they should have listened. Ah, it's a little expensive lesson learned. So, um, yes, exactly. Um, oh, we got a question in for documentation here talking about documentation and templates. What are your thoughts on the new 2023 EM updates and how it will affect documentation? Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to? You know, it's funny because when I see things like this, my first thought is it really shouldn't impact your documentation, right? I mean, your documentation, it does have billing aspects to it, but it's supposed to be the clinical reflection of what happened during that encounter. And the fact that some coding guidelines changed really shouldn't impact the majority of what's going on and what you're documenting for your service. You know, other than, okay, well, maybe now we have to specifically outline something that we were thinking before, but, you know, now we have to have it in writing a little bit more definitively. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think technically it shouldn't change much. I haven't reviewed a lot of records since the guidelines to see if like, hospital physicians and nursing facility physicians are changing up what they're doing now as far as their history exam. But uh, yeah, I, I think that that might be interesting to see. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, what I'm still seeing, even since 2021, when the office stuff changed, is, um, you know, in the EMRs, they still have the PFSH, the RO, and the physician, they're still filling it out every time. And I'm like, you know, you don't have to do this anymore. And, and uh, I was like, just change the template. Mm -hmm. you know, have it be free text and you can type in there. This is why the patient was here. Put in what you think is relevant. You don't have to go mm -hmm. and do 10 of this and 12 of this. And, you know, I, I was like, it's just not necessary. Uh, so that's the thing that I see the most is is that with the with the templates, they they just don't want to change the templates. And and I don't know, I, I know they spent a lot of money probably to design those templates and that maybe mm -hmm. has something to do with it. But um, you know, I think that would help because I'm still seeing those big bloated notes with all the stuff in there. Um on the hospital side, yeah, I I, I think um there was deficiencies in documentation on the inpatient side, you know, before 2023, <laughs> you know, um, you know, we would see, I would see lots of notes that would say, um, good O N, uh, no change. And then that was a whole visit. And, you know, they're wanting a subsequent hospital visit out of that. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, seriously, you know, so, um, 
I think for those that are like that, they needed work well before <laughs> we got to 2023. So right. I think it's just going to be more on, um, I always tell them now, it's more about their brain power than it is all the other junk that came with the enum before, you know, whatever it is that's relevant, they can put, but, you know, really, they, they really have to start paying attention to those assessment and plans. Um, hmm. That's where, you know, the stuff is going to come in um, because it's all off of MDM now and that's where it all lies. Yeah. So and I think when we're doing reviews and, and having discussions with providers, oftentimes, you know, some auditors will get so focused or some coders will get so focused on what they found with the level of service was. Oh, they wanted to bill a level three subsequent, but it's a two. So you should be billing twos. You should be billing twos. Well, sometimes it's not that they should be billing twos. It's that what they're doing truly is a level three subsequent, but they're missing documenting some things that they're doing that would warrant that level three service. And I think that's where I've had to come in sometimes and resolve some conflict between coders and physicians because genuinely there was a gap in what was happening in that documentation. And the coder is just going, no, you're supposed to be billing a lower level of service because I, I audited it and this is what it says. Well, this may have been a clinically more complex patient. Oh, my, comp, my camera oh. dropped out there. <laughs> You disappeared. Hold on. Let me switch over my camera. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, hold on one second. Let me switch over. Stop cam. Oh gosh. One second. I'll get this fixed up. Okay. Start cam settings. There we go. Oh, oh. other camera. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, so making sure that that uh, there's just not things that are being left out of the documentation that can warrant the provider billing the level that they in their mind are like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, that's a good point. And for those people that are, you know, tuning in here to remember, um, when you're doing education and auditing, yeah, you, you're supposed to tell them what is there. You know, yes, it's a two, because that's how you documented it. But I, I don't think it really was a two when you look at, you know, the patient's surroundings and what was going on and all, you know, that's where to the education comes in was like, well, I, I before just add, had a, I say, tell me what you did with this patient. You know, how did the visit go and, and describe that patient to me, you know, and they describe this very ill patient and I'm like, okay, now look at this note. You know, and that's not what the note says. You know, so we have to go by what's documented because that's what they documented. You know, but, you know, as an educator, you have to always try to think a little bit on that. Yes, but, you know, or yes, and, you know, like, yes, this is what it was. And that's what you coded it as. So you were correct in what was documented, but, you know, and then start to show them where they mm -hmm. could have, you yeah. know, documented better and then maybe coded it differently or even if it's coded the same sometimes there's just really pertinent information that is missing that they need to have complete documentation because I'm like what happens when the next physician gets this patient and they're looking back at your note and I've done that before too I said doc ever gotten a patient that's come to you and they brought their records and you're reading through the records and you're like, I have no idea what was going on here. I can't tell what they were trying to do. And, and how come you know, that noted, and I said, have you ever done that? You know, and they're just like, Oh yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, don't be that person to somebody else. You know? So um, sometimes, you know, if you kind of relate it to something that they've done that, it, you know, they didn't think was fun. It's like, well, yeah, you don't want another doctor doing that, you know? So, um, you know, it, it just, um, uh, you have to kind of be able to, I think, present in different ways and kind of mold with how the people are, uh, into what they're doing, uh, and, and how you go about training them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have, uh, people making comments about our, uh, glad about the, um, uh, 2021 about all the bean counting going away, Pam says. Yeah. Uh, or as, as I said, with my patient sitting in bed eating jello and it was a 99233. <laughs> so, you know, th those are ones that really need help. So um, we have, uh, is that, I think this might be, is that you, Sonal? 
Um, so for some reason, Sonal, when Sonal joins us, she shows up on mine as LinkedIn user. So um, we need our physicians to get back to pre-EMR days, capture all the critical thinking on paper. You know, the EMR has been too focused on endless array of checkboxes that leaves physicians, again, back to that bean counting. Yeah. So yes, very, very happy we're done with bean counting. Um, <laughs> yes, it was Sonal. So um Sonal, uh, very good to see you. So Sonal Patel, just uh, putting in a plug for her, my very, very good friend. Um, she's got a, a great podcast, Paint the Medical Picture. So make sure you're checking that one out. Um, I think she was talking about guidelines uh, this last week, and I know she's going to be on Christine's program next week, Christine Hall. So uh, she's making the rounds. <laughs> uh, let's see. Need a so we PM, I agree. And that's why they need to fix their templates. Um, they need to fix the templates. Yeah. Uh, so that's been, I think, a forever problem. And, and I do, I have had people tell me, I was like, you know, those templates really are no good. And they were like, yeah, but we paid for them. And I'm like, okay, well, I understand you paid for it, but you know, why just turn it off or they don't want to make new ones or, mm -hmm. you know, they put all this special stuff in them and each one is now designed their own. And, you know, so I'm like, okay. I said, but just, you know, can you just not do any of that stuff that you don't have to check the boxes just because they're there, you know, um, it, it just gets to be a mess. So um, as we, <laughs> Thanks, Sonal. Uh, does anybody have questions or comments about us as we're uh, almost at the top of our hour? Uh, Victoria, do you have uh, like a good advice for somebody about physician education? You know, one other thing that I think gets missed uh, in regards to new provider education that I always like to stress upon is I used to do a lot of new provider education. I used to um, manage a team of about 12 different auditors. And one of the big things we did was new provider education, which of course you always get flooded in the summer when the residents are coming off and they're, they're getting hired onto, onto the organizations. And uh, one important thing that I, 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 we learned that always stuck with me is when we would bring on new MDs, DOs, they during their education maybe got some kind of little component of how the business of healthcare works. During residency, they probably learned a little bit about E&M, you know, which levels of service they're allowed to build, maybe bill in a primary care exception. So they, they knew a little bit about E&M. So when we would educate them, you know, we could go a little bit faster through scorecards or how we bill things because they're like, oh, yeah, 25 modifier. I've heard of that before, you know, da, 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 da. CRNPs, physician assistants, they get nothing, nothing. So they're coming in and you're like, yeah, you know, the, the review of systems or the risk of complications. And they have no idea what you're talking about because they've never had to do this before. So I think it's also important to remember that, you know, our physician extenders are coming from a different place than our yeah. physicians are when it comes to billing and coding and that we have to approach them a little bit differently and maybe dive into terms a little bit more in depth than we would for a physician because they have probably a, a, a larger understanding. Or sometimes I'll even have, uh, you know, CRNPs that maybe they worked in an urgent care, but someone else did all the billing. They just, you know, didn't handle anything. Now they're here in a different practice and now they have to learn it all. And they're like, oh, I don't, I, I don't know what any of this is. I've never had it before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had it was like I, I just we had a scribe and they just put everything down in there and I, you know, so um but yes yeah that that's a really good that's it's a really good uh pointer um I, I try to start with my education um with asking them you know where where their level is like where where do they kind of see themselves too uh and i've had because uh, of course too we'll get some that you know oh well i do all of it and i'm the best and you know you start <laughs> looking at their stuff and i'm like oh <laughs> but um you know just just what their exposure has been where they've been before too if you're getting mm -hmm. new people coming in if they're already in the field and now they're switching to a new facility, sometimes you need to know what to undo or, you know, what was done at the other place to kind of uh, get all that info. So yeah, do a little Intel on them before you start the education. That's always, always a good uh, way to start out. I think. Oh, well, I like this. Thanks so much y'all. This has been my favorite show so far, Betty. So that's wonderful. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad y'all are enjoying everything. And before, let me put up some different things here for um, 
uh, uh, Victoria here. This is her uh, link to her website, The Contempo Coding. You can also look for all of those fun YouTube videos I was talking about uh, here. And I think Lady also um, posted, she already posted those inside on the, the chat in there in LinkedIn for you. So those are up. Awesome. And here is her LinkedIn profile. That is, you had like every single thing put in there in your profile, didn't you? It's <laughs> <laughs> a really long profile. <laughs> I don't think I have any more characters left that I'm allowed to add. <laughs> <laughs> She's also on Facebook. And um, what do you, are you doing a new podcast with the coding consultant confessions here coming up? Um, we'll see. We did have to take a pause a little while ago, but yeah, we'll have to see if it, if it were able to pick up again soon, but there's the old episodes are still up there and there's some great information in there to check out. So for people that maybe aren't aware of what Coding Consultant Confessions is, do you want to tell everybody? Yeah, so that's a podcast that myself, Tony L. Holmes, and Stacey Buck were doing. And uh, it talks a little bit about, you know, anyone who's interested in maybe becoming a consultant or starting their own business or becoming an entrepreneur in the kind of healthcare, medical coding, medical billing field, gives you some tips and navigation and some funny stories there. Yeah, we always have funny stories, y'all. Um, we can't always share them all, but this <laughs> 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 is so what is this uh, like not ready for prime time kind of thing sometimes. Um, but uh, as I said too, um, uh, on my end, uh, I will be in um, California in Orange for the uh, local chapters uh, E and M workshop. Uh, it will be on February 25th. Uh, Lady, I believe, has posted it and has sent out some information. I made it an uh, event on LinkedIn, so y'all can go check it out um, if you want to uh, join in on that. It'll be six hours. Uh, I made, I developed a game. Um, I had like a coder, not our kind of coder, but, you know, the XOXO1010 oh. kind of <laughs> <Yeah>, programming <laughs> um, coder. Yeah. Yes. Programming coder. Yeah. Um, you know, make it uh, in, uh, for me. So I have a, a, a new e &M game that we play uh, to kind of help us along. And uh, I've also designed a, a coding tool um, that will uh, be given to everybody that attends. Um, so I think it is uh, really fun. It'll be a really good time. So go check it out. Um, check all that stuff on for Victoria. And next next time we meet, I have uh, Bertram Lindquist uh, from Renown Talent. We're going to talk about, um, you know, putting your best foot forward and interviewing and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that should be interesting for people that are, um, out there looking for things and the next thing for them to do. So um, thanks y'all for joining us and thanks for all the great comments. It's so nice. Um, and thank you so much, Victoria. I was like super, super psyched when you said you'd come on here with me. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and y'all have an enjoyable weekend and sorry about the groundhog, but you know, there's always next year. <laughs> Bye y'all. <laughs>